Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Evelyn Marcus, and in addition to being a psychologist, I'm featured in the documentary about anti-Semitism, Never Again Is Now. I am a Dutch Jew and a daughter of Holocaust survivors. In 2006, I immigrated to the United States because of the rising anti-Semitism in Holland. I'm Phyllis Zimbler Miller. I grew up in a small Midwestern town, Elgin, Illinois, where I was the only Jewish child in each of my public school classes. I'm also the founder now of the new of the nonfiction Holocaust Theater Project, Thin Edge of the Wedge. And although I grew up in a small town, not with Holocaust survivors, but with people who's uh, with Jews whose parents had come at the turn of the previous century, escaping the czar and other programs, pogroms. In 1970, I was uh, with my US Army officer husband when we were stationed in Munich, Germany, only 25 years after the end of World War II, it changed our lives forever. Our guest today is Jonah Schwartz. Jonah Schwartz is from Framingham, Massachusetts and graduated from Dunn Academy, a Jewish day school in 2020. In high school, Jonah was a fellow with the Holocaust Legacy Foundation. Through his fellowship, he traveled to Berlin and Poland, visiting concentration camps and other Holocaust sites. He is currently a rising junior at Dickinson College, where he is double majoring in environmental studies and political science. He is involved in Jewish life on campus and is on the board of Hillel as the Tikkun Olam chair. Jonah, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you for having me. Jonah, I had the pleasure of meeting Jody Kipnis, co-founder of the Holocaust Legacy Foundation. When we both attended the Association of Holocaust Organizations Conference in early June in Charlotte, North Carolina. She told me about the anti-Semitic anti experience you faced with your boss at a fast food chain. Can you describe what happened? Yeah, um, so through high school, uh, like you said, I worked at like a pretty well-known uh, fast food chain. And um, like most restaurants, you know, they had like a two week policy for uh, taking time off. But I had forgotten to ask for time off for uh, one of the high holiday services. Um, so like a few days before I asked for it off, they gave it to me. Um, but they also asked me to try to make someone or ask someone to uh, cover my shift. Um, but I wasn't able to. Uh, so I offered to come in after work. Um, like after the service to help them clean up and make sure that everyone could get home on time. Um, so they accepted that and I had come in after work, like thinking that I was- After, you know, after services. Yeah, so after services and like after the, oh, the restaurant had closed to help them clean up and- oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I came in like thinking I was, you know, doing them a favor. Um, but when I walked in, my manager at the time um, immediately just greeted me with like a lot of hate and was saying um, things like, like you really uh, messed with us tonight. Like it was really hard for us. And because of that, like I wish your grandparents had died in the Holocaust. And wow. um, he kept on going. Like at one point he like took a, a wet rag and like drew a swastika on the wall and um, like was pretending to like hail Hitler and was like saying all these things about Hitler that he was like some great guy and yeah. Um, so I was there uh, and I had a few other coworkers there and all the other coworkers were just very uncomfortable in the situation, obviously. Like they were just kind of quiet off to the side, like not like engaging in any of that. Um, and I like just didn't know what to do at the time. Like I was, I was pretty, quiet like I hadn't really faced anything like that before um so yeah I just kind of let him like go through like what he was doing and like like didn't uh like say anything back at the time right and and so wh wh how, how did you what how did you feel when that happened when that was said to you 
oh, I mean, I felt horrible. I mean, like I thought I was going in to help them out and do them a favor, but then I was greeted with all this like anti-Semitic hatred and like all these tropes that I hadn't faced before growing up and just like immediately was thrown on me. And like, it was just really shocking and overwhelming. Yes, yes, yes. I can imagine. I mean, uh, you don't expect such incredible hate, right? Um, and what, what did it make you sad or angry or or afraid or any other emotion? Um, yeah, so I'd say all of that and more. Like this was my manager who was doing all this and someone that I'd worked with like for almost a year before. And like someone who I had hung out with, like I thought was my friend. Um, and then he like just completely switched and um, like he thought he was being funny and it just was not. Could I, I'd like one clarification. What age was this person? I just kind of want to get a feel. Um, he, he was like a, a young adult, I'd say like probably early twenties. Okay. That, that, Cause it's interesting to know what age. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was, I think 17 at the time. Yeah. And, 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 and you said he was friendly with you before, right? Yeah, like we had worked like many shifts before that, like for again almost a year. So like I'd known him pretty well, I thought. And he knew you were Jewish during that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, just let's. Okay. Do Do you have any idea where this hate of his came from? Um. I I don't know. Like I don't think that he's had like much experience with Jewish people in the past. So it's probably. I like after thinking about it afterwards, like it was probably just like again, like the tropes and um, like trends that he sees on, like I guess, social media, probably. Uh huh. Okay. Wow. Horrible. Um, after this happens, I understand you had advice from uh, the other teams. Um, the other team participants preparing uh, to go to on a trip uh, like you to Berlin and Poland. Um, what were you told to do? Yeah, so I, I had a lot of uh, different opinions. Um, that was extremely helpful because like everyone in that trip came from a different background. So I, I was getting like a whole bunch of different experiences and advice from them. Um, but uh, one that really stuck out, I think, was, I mean, to obviously address it. I mean, everyone had the same, like, uh, thing was to address it, of course, in some way. Um, but the, the way about doing that was different. Um, so I decided to uh, go back to work. Uh, I was going back, like, a couple of days after and, um, like, talk to him about it. Um, so I, I went in and I first, like there were three managers working the, the, the next shift I was on. Um, so I first went in and talked to the other two managers and just told them the situation and like how I felt about it. Um, and they were just saying how horrible that was and how like that should not have happened. Um, but they also didn't seem very like, like interested in acting on it at all. Like they just wanted to kind of sweep it under the rug, of course. Um, so then I went up to the, the manager that had done all this and I just told him that all of that was not okay and like in any way and that he obviously thought that he was being funny but it just like was completely anti-Semitic and made me feel really horrible. And then what happened? Um, yeah, so he like seemed receptive of it like he told me yeah i know that was really anti-semitic like he probably knew while you really say the word anti-semitic yeah he did and he he definitely like knew like while all that was happening too that what he was doing was anti-semitic so like it it's like it's tough to say that it made a big effect on him because um like he already knew all of that stuff was going to be hateful um so yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know like the the extent to the effect that had. So I, if I understand you well, um, you confronted him uh, with the fact that what he had said was really anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. um, and then he said, 
I know. Is is that correct? So like, so what's the problem with that, right? Yeah, I mean, he did like apologize in a oh. way, but he again was like, yeah, I, I know that was like, and and tried to kind of downplay it as just like a, a anti-Semitic joke, like as if those are just normal. Like it's normal. Yeah. And how did you feel then? Um, I felt a bit invalidated I'd say um like I was hoping to get more of a apology and like action after that um but again it was just like a, a fast food chain and I felt like I didn't really have a whole lot of power at 17 years old so I I kind of let it go after that for a bit and I I just told him like if I if I like feel that again like I'm gonna like bring it to other managers and like make something else happen how how did you feel when you spoke up uh, to him? That you when you when you confronted him with what he had, how the hate he had spewed at you? Yeah, um, it did feel empowering. I think because after that night, like I just felt horrible. Not even because of like everything that he was saying to me, but because I didn't say anything or like try to educate him back because. I mean, I was in, I was a part of this fellowship and the whole thing was about Holocaust education and um, standing up to anti-Semitism. And like after that night, I felt like I had failed in a way. Um, so to be able to go back and stand up to it, um, even afterwards, like it, it definitely did feel empowering. That's great. That's great. So, you know, at least you spoke up, right? You sent some energy back to him, like, um, you know, he pushed back. And did any of the other witnesses that um, night come to you later and say, oh, I felt terrible? I'm just curious whether they ever said anything about it. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think one of them had overheard me uh, talking to the manager, like the- Subsequently. The, yeah, that afterwards. Um, and uh, they did come up to me and say, like, I, I know, like, I did feel really bad just standing there, like, I. But, but again, they were really uncomfortable and like didn't know what to do in that situation. And so did anybody of the company uh, confront him with what he did? No. Or you were, you were the only one actually? Yeah, no, I was, I was the only one. Wow. Well, you're very courageous and, uh, and I want to commend you for that. Um, so, um, do you think it had any effect? Um, like uh, the, the you're on him, like up. talking to him? Did it have any effect on him or on the people who, who, who saw you do that? Um, I think it definitely made my other coworkers more sensitive of it and like, mm. um, definitely spoke out more to him afterwards like I think he lost a lot of respect among like the co-workers and I um but on him personally I'm, I'm not totally sure it's hard to say the effect that had on him yes and that's that's um I think um interesting that you that you say that because that's what I think is in many cases um, happening when you speak up to a, a perpetrator of hate, um, if that person is, is, if that person's head is filled with an ideology coming from the internet or coming for, from wherever, um, it's very hard, it's very hard. You can, you can present proof even if you want that the person is wrong and it won't help, right? It won't change anything in that person. But two things, they do get the message that you're actually saying, don't mess with me. And the people around, the, 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 the bystanders, they learn a lot. They learn a lot. They learn more about the perpetrator and the, then those people often lose respect. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and they learn how to speak up themselves when something, when hate is happening to them, or even 
when they are a bystander the next time they may be inspired and got some words and tools learned from you from your example you know to help so um, you cannot always expect that the people who, who, who express the hate will change instantly or ever, but the effect is still there, usually on the environment, um, on, on the people who are, who are watching this. So um, that's also an important um, uh, way to, to push back against hate. Speaking up without putting yourself in danger is often so much better to push back against hate than not to speak up at all. Of course, and yeah, and, and even if it internally didn't change how he thought, I'm still like really um, happy and wouldn't have changed the thing about how I approached him afterwards because I know that again, like the coworkers around him lost the respect and um, he outwardly didn't show any more of the anti-Semitic uh, thoughts that he had. Very good. Very good. It worked. It worked a lot. Thank you. And I'd like to say one thing. It would be wonderful if all of us had been trained, et cetera, so that we could have immediately put in, uh, done what you did the next day. But I think it's much better, This now Evelyn may disagree with me, to have waited till you could do it calmly than have responded uh, you know, in anger and escalated the situation and put yourself in physical harm. So I, I, I don't think there's any shame in saying, stepping back, waiting, and then the next day, or, or when, it, you know, when you next went in, being really well prepared. So I, I commend you. Yes, I, I, I agree. It's, it, the, the first thing to do is get your calm back. And whether that is in 10 seconds or whether it is in 24 hours, it uh, doesn't matter. I think the second, great example you gave is you asked for advice, right? right. You asked around. Um, we may all have somebody or, or people around us who we could ask advice from uh, in a situation like that. Um, so that's also uh, something we can learn from you, from your example. Very important. And, and, and as you know, you got different opinions and then you used your own understanding of the situation and your own comfort level, I'm assuming, to choose which of those pieces of advice you would actually do. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about the advice you got from uh, people? Yeah, um, so again, the, the advice was really ranging. Like there is advice to sue the company, like to, <laughs> again, yeah, like bring it to um, higher up managers immediately. Um, to quit the job um, and I like the first two I thought were um, like too drastic before I had gotten the chance to even like stand up for uh, myself and like Jews all over um, by talking to him and I thought that quitting the job would have just been like a easy way out to get out of the situation and I wasn't looking for that right no, I think quitting your job, just my personal opinion, would have been the worst response. That's giving the victory to the manager and you yeah. lose your income. So right. and I think that our show is, is built on the premise that we need to be able to speak up for ourselves and educate people, to educate ourselves and, up, and then the others. Evelyn, next question is yours, I think. Yeah. Um, um, what, what do you think... Jonah, this experience taught you um, for experiencing similar situation going forward? Mm. Um, it, it definitely made me more comfortable like having hard conversations like that about anti-Semitism and standing up to it. Um, like, like I was saying before that, I had never really had like a hard direct experience with anti-Semitism in person. Um, so after that, that just kind of gave me the, the confidence to know that I can and that I have like that power to do it. That's great. Great to hear. What advice do you have for other young people based on your experience? Um, to other young people uh, facing anti-Semitism, I'd, um, 
It's a good question. I tell them to like stick to who they are. Like other people might have thoughts and ideas about who you are, but only you really know about um, your Judaism and what it means to you. So be confident in that and don't let other people tell you like who you are as a Jew. It's great. Uh, we need that um, these days. Um, so you're, you're at college now. Do you experience similar behavior um, at, as, as a college student on campus? Um, no, I, I haven't had any like thing close to being similar as like direct and hateful and like personal as that. Um, I know that there has been like incidents of anti-Semitism on campus and the response to that by the administration and others like the student body has been pretty strong. Um, so I, I do feel good about that on like my campus in particular. That's great. That's great. It's great to know that if something like that would happen to you or to another Jewish student, um, that the that there is, that the environment would be more helpful in uh, dealing with that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead. And I was going to. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, like, and there, there's always going to be like those uh, like anti-Semitic jokes that aren't hateful and in intent, but are, I guess, either core anti-Semitic and like use the anti-Semitic tropes that have spread. Um, so my reaction to those is to explain like how they are anti-Semitic and like most people won't realize it when they do say it because they are just, you know, are we trying to make a joke. Could you give us an example? We don't like to really say a lot of things on this show to give people ammunition. So if you could refer to some trope and then say that you've actually someone said to you and then how you explained it. Because you, again, you said the really important word. Many people we know are just, you know, parroting what they've heard without understanding. So how do you educate them about a specific in incidence? Um, yeah, so um, without like, saying the joke I guess directly but there was one about um like Jews and money of course I mean as you probably know and I just explained to them like how that's clearly anti-semitic and like has um like through history been um like it's tough to explain but like through history has been like ingrained would you like to practice on us would you like to pretend that one of us had said it in what you would say you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, yeah, it's it, it is hard because like everything is different and like yeah. some responses I just say like, hey, like that is very anti-Semitic. Like you, that's a joke that you shouldn't really be saying. And they will be like, okay, no, I understand and move on. Um, like, but if there's pushback, then yeah, you would go further. Do you do you say it in a friendly way to them, or do you say it in an angry way to them? Um, I, I would start with friendly, definitely. Um, and again, it, it's like based off their, their response after uh, me saying that, um, that like how you would continue the conversation. Um, but yeah, I would always start with like a friendly um, response. One of the things that I use uh, in my writings to uh, push back against that is to point out that there are many poor Jews and that Jewish organizations spend a great deal of time and effort uh, helping to support these people. I am sure uh, that a huge number of people have no idea that Jewish organizations are not just political, but do a great deal of work in terms of very basic uh, support for Jews. So I think that that's one easy way to just mm -hmm. say to that's a, a fact that people maybe can understand. And instead of saying not all Jews are rich, I'm, I'm not correcting you, I'm doing this for our audience, is to point out how many Jewish organizations spend a lot of time and money supporting poor Jews. So I have another question. At Hillel, do you have any training sessions? I mean, does Hillel provide uh, sensitivity sessions, I guess, for how young people in college can deal with anti-Semitism? Um, 
Well, we, we do always have like an open space for those conversations. Um, we don't have like direct scheduled uh, trainings, uh, I believe on anti-Semitism, but when incidents do occur, we always send out like a notification saying that Hillel is open for people to come to to talk and walk through these feelings. Interesting. Okay, uh, but they don't prepare students for so those situations or do they? Uh, I, I haven't had like a, a training or like prepared, prepared, like, yeah, for that. I'm kind of stepping on Evelyn's question, but I think that that's something going forward that could be very important for college students to have mm -hmm. these sessions because we all need, I mean, I, Evelyn knows what I'm talking about. I learned assertiveness training a long time ago and I, I to this day use it in terms of when people attack you. And I think that that kind of training could be really good on, on college campuses for Jewish students. And give I agree. more tools. Agree. Yeah. And practice makes perfect, right? Isn't that what we were told when we were little kids? I don't know if it worked for me in certain areas, never could play the piano well. But the thing is, I do think that young people aren't being prepared enough. And, and because anti-Semitism is on the rise, I think, we need to prepare young people and older people much better than we're doing right now. So that's a, I'm giving you a challenge for your T-Cone uh, chair at Hillel, do a program. We'll no, I totally we'll agree. That, would be, that would be a great idea. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually talking with uh, um, somebody, uh, I, I have a training uh, a background as a trainer on uh, verbal aggression, how to deal with it in professional situations. Um, but I'm actually looking into it uh, together with somebody into the possibility of developing such a training program where you can uh, speak up against anti-Semitism without escalating the, the situation. Well, everyone needs that, Evelyn. So get cracking on developing that. <laughs> So we've come to the end of the interview. You've been extremely helpful. We thank you so much. But do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, well, first, I wanted to thank you guys for having me on the podcast. It's been great. Um, and again, like, I guess, back to your question before about what I would say to uh, younger people facing anti-Semitism is to just like be confident and proud of being Jewish and don't let anybody tell you differently. Well, we're certainly pleased to have had you on a guest as a guest and pleased that you're confident in being Jewish. You're a wonderful example for everyone. So thank you, Jonah. Thank our listeners. For those of you who have not seen Evelyn's documentary, Never Again Is Now, please do so. You will learn a great deal. It's very powerful. It's on YouTube and Amazon. And for those of you who would like more information about my free nonfiction Holocaust theater projects developed for students, go to thinedgeofthewedge.com. And for everyone, this is how we end it every time. Whenever you can do this without putting yourself in physical art, please speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate. <laughs>